Well, hi, everybody. My name is Kara Sabansky, and I'm one of your hosts today. I'm an editor at DC Canada, and I'm here with Leonard. Hello, everybody. I'm Leonard, and I'm a senior editor at DC Canada, and I'm here with Kara, and we're going to do some talking about how to use music and songs as a parent when you're teaching your children or in a classroom setting, how to use it both as a general great activity for any teacher, any parent, and a child to engage in, and for general English language or really anything across the curriculum, specifically at some level, how to use it in an ESL environment. Yeah, so music is everywhere. It's in stores, it's concerts, it's on the radio. Why shouldn't it be in the classroom? I mean, it's not just for hippie newfangled teachers. Having music in the classroom is backed by science, and we are going to tell you why. I'm a teacher, um, and I guess one of the first things that comes up is that uh, music is a universal language. You know, it has a mathematical component to it, and it exists in all cultures around the world. Um, all cultures will use music. All cultures have a musical tradition. And it's sort of a, a natural starting point. All your kids will already know some music. They will know how to move to music. They will have rhythm within them. Let me play you a song clip. Reduce, reuse, recycle again. They're very simple words. Reuse, recycle again to save our mother Earth. Yeah, so we just heard this song clip, the three R's. Obviously, this one is just about recycling, but it teaches kids that they can make a difference in the environment, in ecology. Other science-related songs might explore a variety of topics, such as outer space or human anatomy chemistry. I mean, the possibilities are endless. It definitely gives you an in into the whole science area. And that's part of teaching this integrated curriculum. You can use music in history. You can use music in your language arts classroom. You can use it for grammar development, language development, vocabulary development. In any subject matter that you're teaching, there's definitely some research out there to show that that works. Every teacher will be different, but uh, there is certainly a structure yeah, for sure. In terms of brain development, this is music. A lot of evidence out there, or certainly a lot of uh, research, scientific research, that shows that a child's brain and music are closely linked in terms of uh, language acquisition and language development. The brain, when it's uh, young, is learning basic skills such as uh, how, how to concentrate, uh, how to focus, and using songs can help kids focus their mind properly. If they learn these skills in the formative years, there's positive benefits that will follow them all through life. And science has showed that kids that are exposed to music at a very early age, you know, mothers and fathers playing music to their kids while they're in the womb, uh, when you look at those kinds of kids later in life at 20, at 25, and at 30, they have well-developed brains for sure. It can be as simple as, uh, as remembering when to hit a cue. So these are things that in very early formative developmental stages, kids have trouble doing. So, you know, if you use a song and you're having kids either sing it, uh, hopefully in a group dynamic to begin with, a musical interlude will help cue the brain and help the child focus the mind. If you're using a song to help child memorize lyrics, for example, which is a valid activity in ESL for sure, and then of course you see the brain development there and just memorizing lyric. Music will also help a child's brain learn to handle multiple tasks simultaneously, prepping the students. Sort of a format that you can use. You start by first playing the song for simple pleasure. So the kids would just sit there and listen to the music with you as a pleasant environment. But then their brain starts to queue up if they know that there's going to be activities. So if you set up the fact that, you know, depending Depending on your age level, if you're lo looking at little kids, you might have three vocabulary words that are in that song or three movements that you want them to do. Raise your hands, clap, stand, sit, any of these things. Or in the recycle song, you might want to make sure that they understand those three R's, what they really mean. They have to be listening to the song, listening for the key word or the key learning goal that you've set for the class or for the child at the same time. And, and this is sort of the same way that they acquire language. You know, they just listen. No one sits down and says, this is a cup. They just say cup, right? And the child learns that. So science has shown that there is some uh, correlation between the way we acquire language and the way we can acquire language when we use music and lyrics. 
Yeah, and you mentioned uh, the the movement, clopping and all of that. That's definitely another thing that comes into play is the physical development. You not only break up a long school day sitting at a desk by putting some music on and getting the kids to move, but you also develop their attention span and you can work on their coordination through movement or dance and responding to those. And we're going to talk about that a little later as well. And these activities, these movement activities, of course, can be adapted for different learning environments, different amounts of students in the classroom, and also for children with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. If you think about it, when a kid comes into your classroom, if you're in a school, you usually know what class they're coming from, and some kids do well in some classes, some kids do well in other classes. So music can be almost a beginning of every class if you have set your environment up like that, where it, it, necessarily you have no ulterior motive other than to play a song when the children come in and as they're being seated, just to have that music flowing. Science shows that it will relax them. It will get them focused on now we're in this class, and even if we had a bad class previously now we're here and then of course what carrie you just said you can even use a a movement song right away when it when children come into your class simply do have a little bit of a, a two-minute physical moving around the class stretch your arms clap do these kind of things before you start any class that has nothing to do with music after that and that's something we're going to see in this next song clip called raise your hand Who's wearing red? Raise your hand. Who's wearing yellow? Raise your hand. If you're wearing yellow and red, then raise your hands. Close your eyes. Show your teeth for a big surprise. Don't forget our little plan and raise your hands. Okay, so we just heard raise your hand and this is a great type of song for ESL or for lower grades as well. This one in particular talks about colors and body parts, so you can use it for learning that kind of vocabulary. Then it's also a call and response song. So movement as a response to direction, it's asking you, if you have this color on, do this activity. So making those connections, responding to directions, and something that you can look at for the classroom is having these call and responses for different movements, for clapping, foot tapping, turning, sitting, standing, basically anything that'll get that blood flowing and wiggle out the blahs of a math or science or history lesson. Just something a little bit more engaging, really get that movement into the classroom. Using this song that you just heard, we're not going to, we don't have to specifically use this song, but this is a good song with the call and response. But here are some things that you might do with a song like this in an ESL environment. The, very, the first thing, this is, of course, you can do whatever you want to do, but this is one that has been done before, one way of approaching this. So as a teacher or or a parent, you have to determine what you want the kids to know. So in this song, you want them to know color and, and you want them to develop a keen listening skill. So you'll have some key vocabulary words there. If that's what you're doing, it may not be what you're doing. It may be just, I want to play this song so the kids can relax before we start a lesson on um, volcanoes. But if you're using it as a language tool, the first thing you may want to do is have the children sitting in the classroom calm and then you do an active listening and perhaps an active writing exercise. But the first thing to do is just play the song. And you don't show the students any of the words. You don't tell them we're going to do colors today or we're going to do this or that today. You just listen to the song. You're encouraging active listening, which in an ESL environment is a vital part of it. We have to remember that uh, if we're a first language speakers, we have no troubles with the language. So we're using music and we're using the vocabulary. We're understanding that the kids may not understand all the words in the song, and that's okay at this point. After you've listened to the song, you play it a second time, only this time you give them some prompts. Depending on age level again, this will be, you know, as a teacher or parent, you will have to decide what can work here. But after you've encouraged them to actively listen to the song, this time you want them to do something. You want to see if they can recognize a phrase in the song, or in this case, can you recognize color? Can you recognize red or green or any of the colors by doing the activity that the call and response song has asked you to do? You also want to see if they can isolate any words that they don't know in the song. 
And then you want them to think about what's this song about? And so in a simple song like this, that may not be something that you introduce at a higher level. You have a song with more poetic value in it. You would introduce something like that. Play the song as many times as you need to before you have the discussion. Then could do a read along with the song. You read it and then the, the children read it. You will have some kind of an activity, a worksheet in which the children will fill in the blanks, for example, with the key color words or something along that line. Then you can discuss the song again with the student for pronunciation. Again, in an ESL environment, very important, not something that we stress all the time. But if you can't pronounce the word, it's very difficult to feel comfortable trying to say the word. Uh, so you can do pronunciation with words, the colors in this case, with the calls and the responses, phrases. If there's any phrase in there that can be used, if there's any slang in the song, won't be in this song, but in some songs there will be. So you're trying to introduce them to the normalized usage of language in the, la in the second language that they're trying to learn. Then you can do a sing-along. This is where you're starting to do the uh, speaking part of the four components of ESL learning. Listening, of course, has happened. Now you're speaking, so walk it through. You read, remember everyone, kids in ESL environments tend to be shy about using their new language. So hopefully you will have already set up a safe environment for that kind of thing. But you can do a, a read along first where you, the adult, read along with them. Then they can do a read along chorally. And then if you really, really got things happening well, you can do a sing along with the song. And this is where movement will happen. Yeah, I also I love what you said about the fill in the blank in a song, because I remember when I was learning Spanish, which was which is my third language. That's something that was fundamental in our first three years of classes. We would have these lyrics to Spanish songs with blanks in them, and we had to listen to the song and fill it in. So it's, yeah. it's definitely more than for an ESL or lower grade environment. I mean, I started learning Spanish when I was 15, and that was definitely something that helped. Hearing different accents, voices coming at you at different speeds. And with yeah. the music yeah. and sort of combining all of that and learning how to write the words and just... Yeah, all, all around it was a, a great activity. Yeah, we also used those that music to dance and dive into a little bit more of a cultural phenomenon because it was Spanish. We were able to get some dance moves from certain Hispanic countries, um, some salsa moves, that kind of idea. So there right, yeah. definitely so cultural things, right? You were picking up some it, you can pick up some cultural cues there as well through songs and music. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it gives you, like we were saying at the beginning, there's music from all over the world. Every every culture, every point in history has that. So you can definitely pick up something from all over the place. It's like a traveling around the world just by listening to Spotify, you know. Right. Yeah, yeah that's all good. I'm glad to see a real life example there. You were 15 when you started doing that. Yeah. So this can work at all environments. If you have older kids, of course, some of these things aren't going to be where you want to focus. You might want to focus, have a song where you can focus on some of these cultural norms, cultural phenomena, cultural differences that are profound in the world. So, yeah, that's really good to hear that, Kara. <laughs> If you have older kids, rewrite the lyrics is a very good thing to do. So, you know, because that it promotes some uh, conversation, some discussion, making sure that everyone really understands all the keys of the song. You know, you can create a video for the music. You know, children are very in tune to that kind of stuff. And everyone's got a recording device. Not everyone, of course, but lots of people and most schools will have a recording device. Uh, you can create a skit if you don't want to create a video. And then sort of the main thing to remember is that is that as long as the kids are having fun learning, Something will happen here for sure. Well, exactly. I mean, you, you mentioned a few creative outlets there. There's also writing a letter to the artist or writing uh, a song verse or a new song. I remember doing that in grade school. And, and this all works on the interpersonal development because you're bonding with classmates and you're learning how to work as a group. You're sharing, you're listening to others' ideas, and you're, you're being friendly, hopefully, anyways, with your yeah. classmates, <laughs> developing some emotional skills there. And uh, you're also getting to know the teacher as a human being, not just as the all-knowing being who teaches you math and science and language. You know, it's, it's, right, yeah. it goes beyond that. Especially once, uh, once uh, if a teacher brings in music that she really likes or that's part of her, you know, if she's an older teacher, she can talk about. There's all kinds of things that can happen with music and songs in classrooms. Yeah, and not just on an interpersonal level, but for your own personal development. I mean, music is self-expression. 
It's a creative process. You might learn an instrument or how to sing or dance. You might teach your students or your children how to make music, how music is made, how what what goes into making a song for the radio or what goes into creating a concert. You're creating something individual or collective. And you can also critically explore music. What does it mean? Why was this written? What was the context when it was created? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all good. Yeah, those are all you're touching there on integrated curriculum almost and thinking about music and songs, no matter what you're doing with teaching, you can find a way to uh, weave that into your daily experience for kids and they, they will and do love it. Yeah, absolutely. While Leonard and I know a lot about books and education, you probably want to hear what someone more musically inclined has to say about this topic. Here's some thoughts from actual musicians. I think music is an incredible tool for connecting other people. It's great to be able to understand what people are going through through their songs or understanding or rather expressing what you're going through through your music. All in all, it's a great way to start a new friendship with a shared common interest, and it's really fun to be able to discover new artists together and talk about songs that you like. Music can also connect people on a physical level, especially in school. I was in a band for three years in high school and attended many province-wide weekend-long music events where I was able to learn from local artists and collaborate with other musicians my age. Music built strong connections quickly as it is so rooted in emotion. You have to be vulnerable to create meaningful music, and that vulnerability is what leads to close connections with others. Music has been a big part of my longest friendship. We're both musicians and love music on such a deep level. We've shared many stages and band practices over the years. We've always loved being able to share new artists or songs with each other and bond over songs that hold special significance to us and our relationship. I'm able to better understand and relate to her on a deeper level when she shares her songs with me. I know for me personally, music is so important for my mental and emotional health. Music allows me to process my emotions, and it's a cathartic way to release some of my negative emotions that I'm feeling through uh, heavier songs or even uh, sadder ballads. It's also a great way to improve my emotional state with dancey pop hits uh, and lip syncing and singing as loud as I want. It's a great way to just overall feel my emotions and improve upon them. And just like how music can affect my mood, it can also help me focus and keep me motivated. Music for studying or working is vital as it keeps my brain focused on the task at hand. It helps drown out the ambient noise of the space that I'm in, but it also helps with the noise in my mind. Music was so important to me growing up for these reasons. I remember when I would take the school bus every day from about grade five or six, I would relish in the 30 minutes I had before school to just listen to music and be in my own world. It was meditative and it allowed me to mentally prepare for the day. Without those daily 30 minutes, I feel like my days might have gone a little differently. Hi, my name is Tiffany from Unsociably High, and I have a few thoughts on how music impacts emotional health and interpersonal relationships. Although creating music is incredibly beneficial to emotional health, I also experience difficulties around it as well. For example, I always feel like I'm striving to be better, and I don't think there's ever an end game. Like, I don't think I'll ever say, yes, this is how I sound now and I'm happy with it. Right now, it just feels like I just want to keep improving, which sometimes makes me feel stuck, which impacts my emotions because I feel like my self-esteem is negative toward myself in this new weird way. It's not just, oh, I hate the way I look sometimes. It's like, oh, wow, look at me trying to be a singer. Like, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. Who do I think I even am? Hopefully this is not too negative (laughs) and I apologize. But I've recently come to realize that it's not always about sounding your best, but it's just doing the art itself that matters, which brings us to the other hand, the other hand that presents me with whatever skills I've been possessing over time, which can make me feel like I'm in this kind of hypnotic state where I don't care and I just do it. I find that my body feels liberated and I am entirely present. And there was a time in my life where I was going to therapy and accessing these childhood traumas and feeling like my scars were completely open and 
I was looking at them all the time, and whenever I was consistently practicing music, I would be so in the moment and present and not thinking about my PTSD. I was focusing on my breathing in a new way, and I mean slowly over time as well. If you notice where you started and how far you've come, it can be so self-gratifying. Music has definitely impacted my interpersonal relationships. Music gives me a chance to be vulnerable in front of my friends, and although vulnerability can be terrifying, I've found that I've only benefited from it. It can be incredibly healing. I remember one of our first shows we did where my partner said, hey, you should, you should invite all of your friends, and I was so nervous, but it was also so comforting because it felt like a big blanket of high school reunion, and it felt like I was supported, which could also translate to being supported in other aspects as well. It really felt like, hey, Tiff, we love you and we're here for you, like we've been doing all along. My partner and I didn't meet because of the music, but within our relationship, it is definitely what brought us closer together. It's being vulnerable and making mistakes in front of each other that made it feel safe to make mistakes and be vulnerable outside of practice as well. So although practicing the art of music can be challenging and there are just constant obstacles you have to get through, I believe that it is overall healing and necessary for humanity. It's healing for the musician and it's also healing for the listener as well because we're telling our stories and essentially telling their stories as well and everyone just wants to be heard sometimes. You can find out more about these talented artists in the episode description. Okay, our next song clip is from Let's Swing Our Oars, which is a traditional Chinese song. Let's swing our oars all day long As our boat glides on the waves The water reflects the beautiful white tower The green trees and red walls are moving Like I said before we played the song, this is a traditional Chinese song brought to a wider audience. Any Chinese child would most likely recognize this song, whereas if you played this in the Western world, you probably wouldn't know it. I mean, I didn't until I heard it for, for this podcast, actually. But that actually brings you into a discussion on culture and cultural differences, different traditions, how music might be different in different places what is valued in different parts of the world, what is represented through their music. You're doing Asian history, Chinese history. This song will be really good to just talk about. You know, these are really old traditional songs. This is also a good song for just simply turning the lights down in the classroom and listening to it. It has great poetry in it. You can talk about metaphors in it. There's all kinds of things you can do with this song. Well, because music is poetry, right? I mean, the lyrics are poetry. There's also a certain poetry to the sounds that are being created. And I think that's a great way to talk about poetry, not as this old, traditional, historical way of creating, but of, as a contemporary medium that mm -hmm. is still super present today, right? Yeah, and with older kids, if you're doing, using this song and you're doing a unit or you're studying poetry specifically in all of its forms, this is a great way to introduce um, culture that we don't get to study a lot in North American classrooms, especially. Uh, so, yeah, a song like this, there's all kinds of things in this song that for older kids, you know, that they can really get their brain around. And that's the great thing, right? There's just so much music out there. You can definitely find something to adapt to your classroom and to your curriculum. I mean, there's mm -hmm. so many different topics you could have for school songs, bus safety, clothing, family, seasons individuality, directions, animals, anything really. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, I agree. We have a lot of these at GC Canada. You'll find a link in the description to our music collections, but take advantage of all these free music platforms out there. Discover artists that you haven't heard of. Discover music from other parts of the world. 
music is so important in education. Definitely. It's a definitely a universal language. Science is behind how it can help the brain develop. And we're not saying that you have to use songs from DC Canada. We have good songs there and we have songs that are structured for ESL and for early primary kids uh, vocabulary learning, basic things, colors, numbers, parts of body. Uh, but there is, as Kara said, a, uh, there's a plethora of music out there on all the sites and we encourage you to use music no matter where you get it. Well, to close off this episode, Leonard, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to discuss with me today. Yes, of course, Kara. Thank you for uh, asking me to, to talk with you. And I'd also like to give a big thank you to all the educators and parents out there doing what they can to have an engaging classroom. And we hope that this discussion today has given you a few new ideas for how to incorporate music into your learning experience. <laughs>